Welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence based. The team at the Research Works podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders past and present, and would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record this podcast each week, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. We recognise their continued connection to this beautiful budja we call home. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Research Works podcast. Ash, hello. How are you? Hello, Dana. <laughs> I'm very well. How it's are you? Good. I'm very good. Yeah. It's always good to be back in the studio. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Definitely <laughs> the best time of the week. We mm-hmm. get to talk to lots of really interesting people about yep. their interesting work mm-hmm. and today is obviously no exception Absolutely. to that because yep. we have the wonderful Dr. Katrina Kelso, speech and language pathologist, joining us all the way from Canada. Welcome, Katrina. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> thank you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you. And thank you again for staying up late for us, <laughs> keeping the brain going well into the uh, the hours of the night. We really appreciate it. Mm, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, so today we're going to be talking about one of your recent publications, which is titled A Novel Vocabulary Intervention for Poor Comprehenders, a Single Case Study, which was published in the Journal of Clinical Practice in Speech-Language Pathology in 2022. So congratulations on your publication. Um, And before we get talking about it, which I'm very excited to do, we will tell our listeners a little bit more about you, Katrina. So Katrina is a highly experienced speech language pathologist who's worked extensively with school aged children with language, literacy and learning difficulties. She's worked in a range of school settings and community health prior to setting up her private practice in 1998 to cater specifically to the needs of school aged children. Katrina completed a Master's of Education at the University of Western Australia in in 2003, sorry, and recently completed a PhD at Curtin University, exploring how to better identify and treat children with reading comprehension difficulties in primary school. Katrina is currently in Canada, undergoing her postdoctoral research. And as you can see, Katrina has an exceptional amount of experience, both clinically and within the context of education. So we're really excited to add the research layer to this and unpack it all today. That's so impressive, Katrina. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely love it. Yeah, very excited. So Katrina, that's our formal getting to know you, but we obviously do our informal getting to know you uh, as well here on the Research Works podcast. So, our question yes, today. I'm worried about. <laughs> gets worried about this one. Thinking about education made me think about my childhood and made me <laughs> pose this question, which I think I might regret when I tell you all my answer to it. But what's one strange thing you used to believe as a child? Oh. So me first? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> Go for it, Katrina. Guess okay. first. Okay, <laughs> so this, uh, this is not. I suppose it's not uh, not strange in the in the strange sense. But um, I grew up in the country, and it was you, it, of course it was very dark and quiet at night. And for some reason beyond me, when I think about it now, I used to like reading scary books. So I really used to believe that those monsters and those terrible people that were in the books that were committing, well, they weren't crime novels, but they were doing terrible things that really were out there in the dark night. And it was so hard to, so easy, should I say, to believe because it was so dark and so quiet. All those shadows. (laughs) All those sounds. All those shadows, they were all out there. And I don't know why I used to keep reading them because they really scared me. <laughs> oh, the the thrill seeker in you. Yeah, that's right. That's been, right. Must Came must back been. for more. <laughs> Katrina, look, I feel like I can really relate to that. And I think it reflects why these days for movies, they've got like ratings now mm. and there's MA15+. plus. There's a reason for it because <laughs> I think it scarred people like me. So when I was young girls, probably like, I remember sort of late 80s, there was this whole influx of alien abduction movies that were coming out. 
And I was convinced when I was lying in bed and I could see the street light that that was an alien ship coming down to get me. (laughs) And there would be many sleepless nights and I used to really think that would happen. Um, And I I do acknowledge that, you know, every now and then lately there have been some reports of, you know, UFO sightings. I'm like, oh, maybe it's real. I don't know. But um, Look, it was almost debilitating when I was younger, so I did have to stop watching it. But it was everywhere. There was just, I don't know why, there were so many movies about alien abductions in the 80s. Mm. So... I, I, there was. Not, no, I not remember. To remember. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, I do. There was no ratings. It should have been at least R rating <laughs> because it was very scary. Oh, dear. <laughs> not to mention the X-Files. Oh, my gosh. And I was too scared to watch. I can't even hear that sound, you know, the music playing because I'll yeah. just go, yeah, oh. that music. That's oh, exactly I just, right. I couldn't yes. do it. So, yes, uh, all off, <laughs> off from that point. I learnt my lesson. <laughs> Ash, where did this come from? Okay. So <laughs> yeah, my right. answer has as a slightly different perspective to it. So <laughs> okay. I don't I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you probably both remember the game show Wheel of Fortune. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, not yes. well. Didn't, no, it was didn't in the, done a while. Get that. Well, it was growing up in the country. You had very limited uh, yes, access yes. to television Well, there, you know, stations. lots of other game shows, I think, in the late 80s, yeah, early 90s. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if, and they were on every day of the week. Yes. And if someone won that night, they were the carryover champion. Yes. So they got to come back the next night and play again. Yes. Up until I was about 14 years old, I thought that person was called the Cariona champion. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was something that they named oh, the champion for the night. And it, maybe it was named after someone like Mr. Cariona, who was really good at game shows or something. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And my best friend still oh. likes to remind me of it to this day. And I love how no one corrected you or told you otherwise. No, because it kind of, it sounded similar enough that people probably thought I was saying carryover champion, but yeah. it was carryover <laughs> champion. So yeah. <laughs> Oh my like, god. Like those song lyrics that everyone used to get wrong. And wasn't there a Kenny Rogers song yes. in particular that everyone used to get the words? They were t- thought that was something totally different yeah. to, to what they I still were. do that. You just kind of right. as, every time someone goes, What was that word again? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna tell you. I'm just gonna mumble it enough yeah. that you kind of can work out what I'm saying. Well, I will always think about Wheel of Fortune now when yeah. I when I look at you. Yes, think about yes, the, the, yeah, 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 it's a good one. I like it. I like how we took the scary version. We're like, you know, monsters and aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, took, we went down a bit of a dark hole there. Yours at least was still fun. <laughs> Well, I think that is, like you said, is a good segue into what this article is all about. So very excited to talk to everyone about it. So let's just give everyone a bit of a rundown about what we'll be talking about today. So poor comprehenders have difficulty with reading comprehension despite adequate word reading accuracy and fluency. With weaknesses having been identified with lower level vocabulary and grammar skills and higher level language skills, speech pathologists need to be able to tailor their interventions to meet specific individual needs. There is, however, a lack of research on interventions for poor comprehenders. So in this case study, the team aimed to explore a pilot eight-week novel vocabulary intervention on improving word knowledge and have gains generalised to reading comprehension. With improvements having been noted, the outcomes of the study have some important implications in current clinical work and future research. Ooh, Thanks, what a taste Dana. of that. I Thanks. know. Mm. So Katrina, we haven't really covered the topic of comprehension as yet on the podcast. We've talked to, you know, a uh, quite a few speech and language pathologists now. And mm. I feel like we've touched on lots of different, yeah, yeah. you know, areas within that domain. But let's start with comprehension. Mm. What do we mean when we're talking about comprehension and when we define comprehension? And I suppose the second part to that question is how do we identify those who are poor comprehenders? 
Right. Good question. Yeah. So comprehension is essentially our ability to understand language, and that can be language in any form, whether it's spoken language or uh, written language or sign or, um, you know, think about the hieroglyphics or something like that. It's it's that ability to, to make sense of that system of language. Yeah. Uh, in terms of poor comprehenders, they're quite a specific group mm-hmm. uh, that I was looking at rather than children or people who have poor comprehension across the board because a lot of children, um, well, let's talk about children because that's who I was um, uh, focusing on, uh, will have comprehension difficulties for different reasons. But poor comprehenders are that group that Dana actually explained. So the children who can read words uh, fluently and accurately and fluently, Mm. but they struggle to comprehend what they read. So they were like a subgroup of uh, people who struggle with comprehension, I suppose. Mm. Uh, and um, I suppose it's um, it was the other side of what we're looking at in reading. I mean, comprehension is the goal of reading and there's been lots and lots of research into children who struggle with the word reading uh, aspect of reading uh, but not so much in the area of uh, reading comprehension. And uh, now that I've you know done all this work, I know why people don't study that area so much because it's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet it is to tease it all out, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And lots of different factors involved. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what age would we typically, or, or what? What age would we expect to to start to identify poor comprehension in children? Well, and I suppose it's poor comprehenders and poor comprehension are, are two different things. So yeah. that's um, that's one thing. But one of the difficulties with poor comprehension is that it's often masked. So it's quite difficult to pick up um, children who are struggling to comprehend. Mm. And and that's the case for these poor comprehenders in the reading comprehension domain, but also in young children. And I suppose thinking back to uh, when I worked with younger children clinically, uh, you would do an assessment and you could find that a child had very poor uh, listening comprehension skills and you would go and um, and talk to their teachers or their parents or whatever, and they go, oh, no, no, they understand fine. And it's because comprehension is supported by context mm-hmm. and gesture and all sorts of things like that. So sometimes it's not until you actually go and test a child that you can see that their ability to really understand the words and the sentences is is weak. Mm-hmm. And so it can be very difficult to pick up poor comprehension in young children mm-hmm. uh, until they often go to school, that sort of formal aspect of um, kindergarten or preschool or what have you, because all of a sudden the language is shifted out of context. You don't have all that support of home where, you know, the routines See. and parents can fill in the gaps, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. In the case of reading comprehension difficulties, they often don't tend to be identified until middle primary school because the focus of the early primary years is on learning how to read the words. Yes. And so your language skills are uh, or the, the text that you're reading is well within your language ability. So you, you're not having trouble with the comprehension. It's only when the text start to, start to get more difficult um, and uh, there's this sort of saying, I suppose, or um, for want of a better word, talking about in the early years we're looking at learning to read mm. and then about middle primary, so year three or four, the shift is to uh, reading to learn. And it's almost like... Um, uh, open slather with text. You know, there's the vocabulary stops to be controlled and you're asked to go and explore all sorts of other topic areas. Mm-hmm. And so the complexity of the tasks, uh, of the text, should I say, can get um, much more difficult. And that's when the difficulties can start to become more apparent. Uh, clinically, uh, just as a bit of an aside here, some of the children that I'd get referred, it was often because they started to struggle with maths. Right. Uh, so they were actually doing quite well. Well, but the, because the maths got put into word problems, so you, um, it was like problem solving maths, yeah. they couldn't extract the maths from the word problems. Does that make sense? Yeah, so take away sometimes that the kids away. were coming in. Yeah. 
that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So if you told them the number part, sure. the maths, they could do the maths, sure. the algebra, yeah. Yeah. but they couldn't extract that information from the word problem. Yeah. Uh, so a number of children actually came to me clinically because they started to fail with maths. And some wise person said, perhaps you better go and Isn't see a speech pathologist and have a look at their an explore of their language skills. Wow. So there's not a simple answer to that no. question, I'm sorry. No, no. I, I mean, I, there's lots of other questions <laughs> I would like to ask. As well. I'll follow up to that. But I think, you know, I'm really interested in, I suppose, how you how you tease that out. Mm. So in, in an assessment, for example, you know, it's you were saying, you know, children are learning to read and then you read to learn. But how do you... I suppose, how do you identify in that reading to learn, you know, phase of development if there are comprehension difficulties? What kinds of questions oh, would you be asking? Has, or Yeah. Oh, in an assessment? Well, I mean, mm. someone's got to pick up that there's a problem mm. there. Yeah. But if they came in for an assessment, then we would go through an assessment battery. So you can assess vocabulary, uh, understanding of vocabulary, understanding of grammar, understanding of texts, mm. all those sorts of things. Mm. And that's what comes out in the research when mm. they do longitudinal studies uh, of children. So, and there's been a couple in um, the United States when they've tested children uh, in uh, kindergarten and then tracked them over time, they can see that there's difficulties in their oral language from the early stages, but um, they're tracking those children and then they can see that that ends up being a reading comprehension difficulty down the track. Mm -hmm. But if you're not involved in a longitudinal study, which most people aren't, no. <laughs> uh, then the the difficulties aren't picked up until the, the complexity of the sure. task and the text becomes beyond the child's capabilities. Mm. But there's certainly, we have lots of tests as speech language pathologists to test those um, particular areas. Mm -hmm. uh, look, there's there's issues around that, and we could talk about that one for hours, but <laughs> okay. there is ways of, of sure. testing those different things out. Yeah. So in the paper that we're talking about today, you refer to two broad groups of children with poor comprehension. So can we just talk about those groups and, and how they are characterised? Sure. So they're within that poor comprehender profile, mm -hmm. so those kids who are reading words accurately and fluently yep. but have poor, um, poor comprehension of the text that they read. Yep. So... Uh, in there's you know a reasonably large body of research in that area now, and uh, there is some debate around this, as there is in much research uh, about these two profiles. Um, but there's there seems to have been sort of these two strands of research at looking at these profiles, and one is that there's a group of children that have poor vocabulary and grammar knowledge, and often we talk about or or it's referred to in the literature, I suppose, as these are being low lower level language skills mm -hmm. and so they're uh, uh, further away from reading comprehension but obviously they're the, the basis of communication and those uh, those children also will have difficulty with higher level language difficulties yeah. um a higher level language skills, should I say, and then that group that just have don't have the problems with vocabulary and grammar have difficulty with higher level language skills, and they're uh, they're into sort of three areas: um, the ability to make inferences, so to fill in the gaps when yeah. information isn't provided explicitly; the ability to understand uh, different structures of text, so that a narrative has a particular structure. Yeah. Um, which is different to a procedure, which is different to a persuasive text. And, of course, they're in spoken language as well, um, but we tend, uh, unless you're doing a lecture or something like that, you don't tend to think about those as having a specific uh, as, sure. As specific a structure as written language yeah. and an area called comprehension monitoring, which is the ability to actually go, oh, I didn't understand, I need to do something about it. Yeah. And these poor comprehend comprehenders have been found to be particularly poor at doing that comprehension monitoring. Mm. So there's people who argue that all poor comprehenders actually do have difficulties at the vocabulary level, uh, but other people have done research and and controlled for that and found that, in, in fact, these children do have um, average for age 
uh, vocabulary skills. I mean, it sounds so... It, it, I mean, I, I understand now why this area of research is so tricky, even yeah. as you describe it. You kind of go, well, if you really want to assess comprehension and when there's all this context that we give and, and you know, all the inferences that can be made from a lot of that too, I just go, wow, it's just, it is so complex because communication involves so many different means that we put into it, right? And so if you're really trying to, to delve into it, you kind yeah. of go, wow, how... What does that even look like? So what you've just described there, is that, I mean, in this paper you talk about receptive vocabulary. Is that what you mean by those sort of high level um, sort of language skills? Have I got that right? <laughs> no. No, it's, okay. And, 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 receptive, and the receptive vocabulary, you know, that's not a straightforward thing yeah, either. So yep. by receptive vocabulary, we basically mean how many words you have in your uh, semantic store in your lexicon okay, for, the, okay, yeah. for the want of that's a that's the fancy word for it. Okay, but yeah. even that's not straightforward because mm. you can have words that you recognise, mm. and one of the common ways we uh, test for this is we uh, present a, a sheet with four pictures and and say a word to the child mm. and say point to the picture that goes best with that word. Mm. So that means that you can recognise you know you recognize that word at some level right. but if you turned around so we call that uh, vocabulary breadth yep. um, and then you have vocabulary depth which is a different um, uh, degree of understanding of words and that would be okay so now you've recognized that that you know that word mm. but can you give me a definition of that word mm. can you actually use that mm. word in a sentence yeah. which is something much more complicated and yeah. we often do that we say oh yeah I've heard of that word mm. but yeah how do I how do I define it I'm not sure that I can mm. and you come across that when you read you know yeah. you, there's uh, you see words and and of course, words don't operate in just as singular items. Mm. You know, vocabulary occurs in the context of a sentence. So you can read and you can go, okay, well, I don't really know the meaning of that word, but that from the context, I can work out what this person's written sure. or what this person sure. said. Does that make yeah, sense? I mean, so, yeah. so even when we're talking about receptive vocabulary, we're not we're talking, talking about, about different, yeah, um, yeah. I'm kind of thinking in relation to when I first went concept. into research or even into health and you're mm. reading an article and you know it's in English and there's a lot of words or a lot of jargon used in it mm -hmm. and I'm I'm reading it and I can mm. sort of decipher mm. maybe what some of the words are. Yeah. But then when I go back and go, what on earth was that paragraph about? I, I probably can't even describe it. And it, it mm -hmm. takes – and there's often no context. We don't know that area well. So you just read it and you're kind of going, what, I, what does this mean? And I think as you describe in it, though I don't have the vocabulary to describe what I'm – what my difficulties might be, I relate it to sort of reading that going, yeah. I can read the words. I know the meaning of some of the words. Yeah. But in put all together, I don't really get I what they're saying. I draw meaning from it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's one of the sort of uh, most used models of, of reading comprehension. Right. It's called the simple view of reading, mm. which say, says that, you know, to comprehend, you have to be able to decode the words, mm. but that's not enough in and of itself. Mm. You have to have the language skills yep. and, and reading comprehension is a, is a product of the skill that you have in both areas. Yeah. And you can, you can read, uh, you know, there's kids who can read words, which is these poor comprehenders, but they don't understand yep. but then on the, the opposite side you have children whose listening comprehension and their language comprehension is quite high mm -hmm. but they struggle to uh, decode the words so that's so those kids who are uh, sort of classically called dyslexics mm -hmm. uh, they will have reading comprehension difficulties as well but for a different reason sure. mm -hmm. if that makes yeah, sense yeah. And, of course, what you've opened up there is then a whole <laughs> other um, Pandora's box that we're not just talking about words and language. We're talking about how much background knowledge do you have? Yep. So if you came back to that text as you learned more about that field yep. of research that you were reading about, then you comprehend it better yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So background knowledge is important. Yeah. You talk about words. Uh, we can have words that have different levels of meaning mm -hmm. so that you have the literal meaning of something and then the figurative meaning. Mm. So to be able to understand things like uh, pull up your socks, um, um, you know, come on, pull out or get a wriggle on or something or other like that. It yeah. doesn't mean to 
that you literally have to pull up your socks or yeah, yeah, um, yeah. or wriggle around on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> um, they ha- they have different meanings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was talking to to a group of um, uh, speech language pathologists today about how we have a word, uh, the word W I N D, for example. Now you don't know what W I N D is until you put that word in a sentence because it can be wind or wind. <laughs> so yeah. there's all sorts of other factors yeah. that come into play. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did know language, you know, language is complicated, but I certainly after delving into this realised why people <laughs> were, were more reluctant to explore reading comprehension or do research well, can, in the field. You can absolutely yeah. see why this word is such an difficulties. area of research because when you want to try to develop an intervention, <laughs> there are so many aspects that yeah. when you put it, you know, when you just break it down. So what is it that you're actually yeah, doing and such a, yeah. a, well, from from what you've explained, Katrina, such mm. a, a heterogeneous mm. problem to try and a, address that mm. to me it sounds like, yes. you know, any kind of support or intervention that you would be providing to people with difficulties, you know, yeah. with poor comprehension has to be really individualised because it could be, you know, an issue at the, like you were saying, with lower level language and those building blocks or it could be an issue with the higher level language skills or it could be a combination of those Mm. things so it's really there's really not a one-size-fits-all approach is there (laughs) absolutely yes they're definitely a heterogeneous uh, group and and yeah you could uh, you know looking at the research and my own research there wasn't a particular task or a particular skill that made that group yeah. stand out probably yeah. the one thing was that on the whole they had difficulty with uh, auditory working memory that seemed to be weak and i think that's come up in one of your previous discussions mm, that children that's right, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. with language difficulties tend yeah. to have poor auditory working memory yeah mm. So so the aim of your study that we're talking about today was to investigate the effect of vocabulary instruction on reading comprehension of poor comprehenders. I feel like we have a bit of a better understanding now yeah. of, of yeah, poor do. comprehenders. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the basis of the intervention? And from there, you know, what were the aims of your study? Uh, so uh, what this is was part of a larger um body of research mm-hmm. so um because and it came out of a clinical question this is what got me into the phd because i you know had started looking at this area of reading comprehension and then i'm going well what am i supposed to do to help these children yeah. and from the reading i did and the people i spoke to they said just try a little bit of everything yeah. and i just went there's got to be a better answer than that yeah. than, than try a little bit of and, and that's logical i suppose yeah. But in just sort of throwing everything at them, you don't really know what's effective, what's what's, what's helping yep. um, the child. So uh, be looking at those two sort of different profiles uh, of uh, poor comprehenders, the ones that have the vocabulary and uh, grammar difficulties as well as the higher level difficulties, is there a better approach for those children than there is for the children that seem to have um, average for age vocabulary and grammar skills or grammatical comprehension and their problems were more at that higher level. So that's what I was looking to explore. Um, Do I see these profiles when I look at a group of children and can I develop an intervention that is uh, different um, and targets those particular skill areas? And... um, and you might be going to ask this later, but mm-hmm. it comes in at this point in time. When I looked at that group, we expected to see these two groups um, uh, uh, appear in about equal numbers uh, with difficulties in, and, and present with those two different profiles. But mm-hmm. unexpectedly, uh, we didn't. We found most of the, the children in my research actually just had difficulty with that higher level uh, in that higher level comprehension area and not a, a lot had difficulty with the lower level uh, skills and I think that is probably I use standardized tests because that's what uh, speech language pathologists use clinically mm. uh, so I wanted to use something that do something that was functional mm. and it it potentially was something to do with using standardized tests that they're just not sensitive enough to pick up difficulties. Mm, yeah, um, that's interesting. 
So in terms of the goals then, what I was trying to look at was if we developed an intervention that targeted vocabulary specifically, could we affect change and could we see a transfer into uh, onto tests of or standardised tests mm. of reading comprehension mm. because that seemed to be the difficulty that you weren't making a change in reading comprehension and that's because vocabulary is more distant yes. to that whole area of reading comprehension. Yes. Yeah. And I really wanted to ask you about your study design because it's described as a case study which we know, you know, if we're looking at the hierarchy of evidence it sits um, you know, at the the lower level in terms of the evidence generated. But, um, you know, we acknowledge these are really unique designs and, and we love, you know, getting to learn more about them. So yeah. can you tell us why um, what you did was unique and what the reasoning behind the case study design was? Well, the, the reason for the case study was because we didn't find many children yeah. who had vocabulary difficulties. Yeah. So out of out of the group of children, we only found two oh. um, that met those criteria mm. and only one of them agreed to participate mm. in the intervention. Mm. So that was really just a um, pragmatic issue, really. Um, but, um, you know, case studies definitely have their value. Of course, th- there are issue, I- issues from a research um point of view in terms of the robustness of a, of a case study. Um, but uh, we did have, because uh, uh, it was part of a larger research program, we had a really detailed profile of this child mm-hmm. that we gathered um, earlier on in, the, in uh, the research. So this profile information was probably, um, uh, was about 12 months, I think, before the intervention. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we did end up having two baselines, I suppose, as such, Mm. because we had that information and then we had another uh, baseline pre-assessment. So we could see whether that child had actually made gains because there's developmental issues there and and the child's in school. And Mm. um, so, you know, you would expect there to be change over that Mm. uh, time. Mm. Uh, But we did have those baseline measures and there was some progress on some of those measures between in that 12 month period but the one thing that hadn't actually shifted was her reading comprehension right. score yeah. um, so because we use standardized tests that there uh, you know you can look at a change over time but the standard sc- standard scores or the normative scores are against your age group yeah. so yeah. it means that you're still measuring the same thing yeah. at the a, a, even though you're looking at it at a different point in time mm-hmm. Um, so the other thing that was in the design was the use of a bespoke measure and that came out because um, much of the re- previous research had shown that uh, and and also discussion with people who know far more about vocabulary and vocabulary intervention than I do said that standardised tests do not tend to um, pick up uh vocabulary difficulties mm. and they don't are not good to measure change you really if in particularly change in short periods of time you really need to use a bespoke measure and so that's why I went and looked for a measure like that yeah. whereas uh, say the uh, uh, task I told you about when you say a word and you point to the picture yeah. that will tell you if there's a difficulty there or not yeah. but it's it doesn't guide intervention and it's yeah. not sensitive enough to change mm. so that was probably the other thing was the use of that bespoke measure um, and and having two pre-intervention measures um, they're good and baselines, then, really, um, weren't they? As a control for yeah, maturation, baselines. yeah. It was kind of yes, it, yes. It, as you describe, right. sorry to interrupt there, but I just want to say, like, you've described no, all these fine. elements of what you've done in a case study, mm. um, and you've just amped it up by having these standardized measures, and it's like almost it's prospective. So you are you've you've controlled for maturation by using those, yeah. by using that. Like, how many case studies would you have? Would you have that? You know confidence and knowing this is where the child is currently performing. And I love how even when you said, okay, it was a pragmatic reason for choosing it. Um, But if it's, these are the cases where 
because everyone's so individual, you, you can't put them into groups and try to compare because everything's going to wash out in the means. Yeah. Mm. So it's so variable. It is yeah. so variable. So I love that in everything you said that, my, I mean, my brain was going bing, 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 so many <laughs> things. Um, so you've controlled for that. The standardized measures, I love how you've, that was a big thing that came out in this paper mm. that it really wasn't that great in picking up change. And so the use, and which makes sense given how heterogeneous yeah, it is, yep. and then the bespoke measure, well, that's almost like, you know, single case experimental designs. You know, you do yeah. often use them as target behaviours. They are very personalised mm. because it makes sense for that particular child and, and their unique combination yeah. of factors that influence their comprehension. Yeah. So mm. I just feel like it was worth going into that because sometimes I think you can read you know, a case study and you can't have a case study and compare it and say they're all the same no. um, because you can see we're no, here and, it's and really robust. Yeah. Yes, and, and that was an issue with, mm. the, with the other intervention. So I did another intervention that had the larger group of children that was looking at targeting those higher level yeah. language skills, in particular inferencing, and that was the feedback that I got, you know, why? because I did that as a series of case single case designs yeah. Yeah. and... And the feedback from um, reviewers and things was, where's the stats? Where's the stats? And I'm saying, well, no, no, you can't. <laughs> if you collapse it into a group, yeah. then, yes, you will uh, You will just get average performance. Mm. And because they're heterogeneous, yeah. you can't really look at them that yeah. way. Yeah. And I think the other nice thing about this particular measure that, that I found um, is that it had some measures of phonological skills. So uh, the child had to repeat the word and spell the word and I think think of a rhyming word mm. was was that was the three tasks. So it had some phonological tasks as well as some uh, word meaning tasks. And the child did, uh, she performed at ceiling or close to ceiling on all those phonological tasks, mm. which fits in with, uh, with the profile yeah. of poor comprehenders. Yeah. So it was really... Even within that measure, we could reinforce that her phonological skills were intact. It was her um, vocabulary skills that were weak. So yeah. it was a really nice measure. Uh, and uh, thanks to one of my co-supervisors, we could actually do some stats on the measure, <laughs> which was wonderful. So yeah. We could actually see that the change that occurred um, in those measures across time was a, was actually statistically significant, yeah. which was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's touch on the intervention then, which, you know, was a, a big part of the um the case study. So what did you include in your intervention and how does that compare to what is currently done in clinical practice? So probably in terms of the structure of the intervention, it's not that different to clinical practice. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of working on semantic organisation is mm -hmm. something that's um, that's well known in uh, language fields. So the idea that I suppose if you think of words kind of having layers mm -hmm. in a way, um, people love talking about layers of onions and <laughs> things like that, but it is a little bit like that, yeah. you know. So you have your word um, and then let's say the word Shoe. Mm -hmm. Can you think of an associated word? So shoe goes with sock. Um, and then um, moving further out, can you give a definition of that word? Can you think, or that's that's far out. Can you think of um, um, what's, what's a closer skill? Uh, similarities and differences. Can you just say, so a related word is um, shoe, shoe, sock. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, say how those words are the same? How are they different? Mm -hmm. Then can you give word definitions? So that, that's not new uh, in, in language intervention at all. Mm -hmm. So we could call that a semantic organisation approach. So that's something that people would be familiar with. I suppose what was different about this intervention was the way the words were selected. Uh -huh. So I actually had uh, gone through some age, uh, um, yeah, age and reading age, which was a pro you know the child could decode words at her um, at her chronological age. So I, I had selected words uh, out of texts that were these harder words. So we could, we refer to them as tier two words. So they're words that are used more in writing. So tier one words are. 
uh, everyday words um, and tier two words are the more descriptive words and words that we see much more in written language, which is one of the reasons that, that written language is much harder to comprehend often, and picked out these words and got her to rate her knowledge of them. So I've never heard of the word to I know the word well and I could use it. So it was a um, three-point uh, three scale and then I developed uh, uh, or selected the words to, to go in the treated um uh, list and then paired them with uh, similar words in terms of the level of knowledge right. and the part of speech, so whether they were a noun or a verb or yeah. an adjective, and um, and had a list of untreated words. And so the structure would be of the of the intervention in terms of that word selection and how they were dealt with would be different right. to what you would do mm. in a clinical context. Right. And that's very. I mean. The way you've described it matches the sort of theory that you've put behind it. And yeah. I guess that gives clinicians a bit of a structure around, you know, how they might problem solve for each individual. And, and I saw that when you did this intervention, it was two 30-minute sessions over eight weeks, which is, you know, it's it's very practical. It's something yeah. that could translate. Yes. And, and I guess from a, sorry, no. <laughs> but I guess from a, like a, what this means from a practical perspective and the outcomes, what would you sort of say in terms of what were the main take-home outcomes from this intervention, would you say? Uh, I think that uh, you could see change. Uh -huh. I mean, there was change evident We uh, in that relatively short period of time. Mm. Um, one of the real issues with um, vocabulary interventions, while people uh, talk about how um, vocabulary is um, critically uh, linked to reading comprehension, and of course that makes sense, um, um, at, at just not even at a theoretical level, yeah. we, we say that and you go, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But in fact, there's very little evidence to see that working on vocabulary affects change in on standardised reading comprehension tests. So most mm. um, studies that have been done, you can see improvements in vocabulary on treat, the treated words, you, and so that the idea of that transfer to untreated words was a little was really nice to see in the intervention that I did too. You can see improvements on comprehension texts that include the words that have been treated, yeah. but it isn't that common to see transfer to uh, standardised reading comprehension tests. So that was one of the really positive outcomes and probably the, the best outcome yeah. for, uh, um, in terms of uh, the outcomes for this particular child. That's where she progressed the most. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and it's interesting, and, and because of vocabulary, you know, how, how many words do you teach? Um you you can't just teach individual words and expect improvements in vocabulary. It just doesn't sure. happen like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what you're trying to do, I suppose, is almost stimulate that vocabulary system. Mm. Uh, and um, some of the research uh, into vocabulary interventions has looked at picking up on key words that are used, particularly with high school students, words that are used perhaps in a um, uh, subject area or words that uh, instruction words and things like that, mm -hmm. and that can make a difference mm -hmm. to comprehension. Yeah. I'd love to talk uh, about the, I suppose, what this case study means for clinical practice and, and future research. One of the things that I loved about the intervention um, is, you know, the, the two 30-minute sessions. Mm. You, I think that really speaks to your experience in the edu education sector and the fact that that's something that could yeah. be easily implemented, you know, into the, the education setting to support these children. But what, what are some of the other implications for clinical practice? 
Um, well, well, again, I think it's that you know it, it's there's a structure there. Yeah, um, yeah. In, if you're talking about um, clinicians, there's a structure that, and you can just slot your words in mm. um, and 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 follow that structure. So it's something that can be picked up and run with quite easily. Um, it would be uh, in terms of future directions. It would be really nice to see how it uh, uh, could be uh, implemented in a classroom context. Mm rather than uh, just a clinical context. Um, What are the other implications? I think that that it's... I mean, it, this was just a single case study, but that you did see change in reading comprehension, mm. which was was really positive. Yeah. And uh, there hasn't been much done on uh, 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 it, uh, it hasn't been much research on uh, specifically with. Uh, poor comprehenders, but the one other uh, well-structured uh, intervention uh, study there was also felt uh, uh, the indication was that vocabulary uh, was the driver to the improvement, although it wasn't specifically just working mm. on vocabulary. Mm. And that was another study that did see some shift on standardised reading comprehension mm. tests. So I think that's that's the other positive one yeah. from a clinical point of view. Yeah. Um, that you can pick it up and run with it yeah. and hopefully if it, you know, when you do it, you'll actually see improvements yeah. in yeah. reading comprehension. And I think, Katrina, that's great because that's the the point. You know, so yeah. people can pick up this article and read through the protocol. I mean, we've, we've discussed it here today and and what the main points are, but for people who want to carry this out, you know, yeah. you, it's written there and people can follow that as a structure. Yeah. Um, so mm. I guess maybe to put it all together now, mm. <laughs> we are going to go to the next segment, which I know you're very much looking forward to, <laughs> And it's called Tell It to Ed. So Ed, oh, as you right. know, is our producer. He doesn't have a background in child health, and I'm pretty sure not in this area too. So this would be very interesting for you to summarise mm. this research in about 60 seconds or so. And Ed will in turn have time for a question. So are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as ready as, ready as I'm ever no going pressure. to be. That's All right, right. <laughs> no pressure. All right, no pressure. But just 60 okay. seconds. <laughs> okay. All right, take All it right. away, Katrina. <laughs> Right. So uh, I suppose the first point is that comprehension is the goal of reading. Um, So uh, with this group uh, that I was exploring here, they were called poor comprehenders. So these are children who can read accurately and fluently, but they struggle to understand what it is that they've read. Some of these children have difficulty with vocabulary, understanding vocabulary and and, uh, grammar, so sentence structure, as well as having difficulty understanding text and making inferences and uh, being able to know when they're not understanding. And then a second group that doesn't have those uh, vocabulary and grammar difficulties but has those higher level uh, language difficulties. So I was looking at a child who had those vocabulary difficulties in this and um, devised uh, an intervention uh, that focused on trying to um, develop their knowledge of uh, tier two vocabulary words, so those more descriptive words that are used in in reading. So um, I I got the child to rate her understanding of different words and then designed uh, an intervention that had um, treated words and untreated words and uh, then looked at the outcomes out of that in terms of did uh, improvements occur and very excitingly for for anyone who does research saw improvements in both um, on both the treated words and the untreated words although that was a bit of a delay so we have to think did it take her time to actually uh, use those word learning skills to actually apply Mm. them down the track and um and also really excitingly saw an improvement on her uh, uh, on a measure of standardised um, reading comprehension. So that was really positive too. And and I suppose the outcomes that for clinicians is that this is a program that they can pick up and run with. And I think from for parents, the, the takeaway is that if you talk to your children, if you really focus on um, d- talking about words, that you come across when you're reading to your child and particularly for children who are poor readers or aren't interested that you actually read to them and discuss words and build vocabulary that you can see a real improvement in those skill areas. 
Great. Was that 60 seconds? Wow. Well, I would say maybe a little bit more than 60 <laughs> seconds, but very it was a very good comprehensive <laughs> summary. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. All right, Ed, over to you for a question. Well, that was a, a very interesting um, <laughs> a conversation. And um, I, I think before I make a bit of a goose of myself, um, I, I'm trying to establish um, uh, what's the prevalence of, of kids with... Um, uh, young people with with comprehension difficulties is, is is it getting worse or is it getting better? Oh gosh, that's a minefield. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that was probably the precursor to what I was going to ask about. Particular. All oh, right, in terms of this particular group. Um, and uh, for poor comprehenders, it really the the prevalence rates have varied over time, depending on what your cutoff criteria are. Okay. So that's okay. always mm. what you're looking at. But the consensus for this particular group who um, can read accurately and fluently but struggle with comprehension is around about seven percent. Mm. But it does the 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 prevalence rate does increase over school years. Mm. So uh, that's because the texts get more difficult yeah. and the demands of the tasks mm. that the kids have yeah. to do gets more difficult. Yeah. So it's there's not a sort of fixed answer to it. Mm. And if you're talking about is it getting higher, then we're into the um, discussion about uh, screen time and, ah. <laughs> and all sorts of things like that. And that that's um, actually where I was going to go. Yes. Oh, so. yes. right. Okay, I thought you might yeah, yeah, she, she knew. <laughs> I was going to say, do we, do we need another episode? Yeah, yeah no, no, we do. <laughs> <laughs> deeper. Yeah, that's a minefield I'm not going to go into. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess my question to, to all of that is, and um, for for listeners reference i'm I'm getting towards the the five zero mark in life and so I remember a time before uh, all things social media and um, it, with the advent of social media we've kind of gone from from sharing long form stories and now to you know the world of Twitter and TikTok where mm. where messages get kind of communicated very very short or in such a small character mm. amount and my layman's understanding is that like people seem uh, to be looking for sound bites, looking for the the easiest, tiniest little explanation for mm. something without fully comprehending or going deeper into items. And I wonder whether that broadly has an effect on on comprehension and mm. communication and all the rest of it. Oh. The short answer is yes, and there's actually some people doing some research in this area because it's it's not necessarily strictly a comprehension thing, it's an attention thing mm. because we get the information in little bits and pieces yeah. mm. um, and then we're distracted by things, you know, and certainly with phones you just, you know, if it pings, you're doing something and you ping and it, and it distracts you and what have you. And there's there's a... Um, uh, a woman called Dr. Marianne Wolfe, and she's mm. certainly been talking about this whole area that we are not reading as deeply as we did before, mm. and we are losing the art of actually sitting down and reading mm. deeply and 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 comprehending yeah. deeply text yeah. because of all these um, distractions that that are in our lives, yeah. and because yeah. of the way information is presented to us yeah. in little bites and you know across screens and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's really good question. Oh, Ed, you're the carry owner champ of good questions. Well done, Nat. I love it. Now we all know what that means when we say it. <laughs> that was a good question. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah. Gosh, that was a good conversation. A great conversation. Yep. Thank you so thanks much, so Katrina. Much. And, mm. and thanks for giving up That's your late oh. evening to, to talk with us. We we must let you go so you can go and get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually in bed by this time. Yeah. I'm thinking back 12 hours ago. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for your time, for going into the detail for yeah. us. You know, obviously this is an area that we're not familiar with. So yep. thank you for teaching us. Yep. Um, and to all of our listeners, if you want to get a copy of this paper, really mm. worthwhile looking at reading, um, please head to our website researchworks.net and there'll be links there to this particular paper yeah. and of course as usual there's a cpd form there that you can fill out as well if you want to keep this as part of a record of your pd requirements for now thank yeah. you I have to say goodbye <laughs> and goodbye <laughs> thank yes, you everyone for listening thank, you. thank Thanks. you so much for joining we'll talk to you all again next time thanks katrina bye, bye. <laughs>
Bye.